Okay, here we go. So, um, yeah, welcome this uh, beautiful afternoon. Um, I'll be talking on worldviews, Christian faith and science and how they relate. And um, here's a table of contents. Uh, the first thing is, of course, what is the relation between these different things which I'm going to talk about. Um, then is the question, what can natural science describe and how does it do it? And um, following that, I want to ask, what do we follow, proof or evidence? What can we prove and what convinces you? Um, then I'm going to talk about the questions atheism and Christianity should answer, some of them, and a case study, a universe from nothing. Um, so I will just uh, go on to one topic because we don't have time for all these uh, different topics. And there is, of course, another bunch of questions which I want to mention. We can discuss about them later and draw, of course, some, conclu some conclusion um, on the response to the claim of atheism. So let's start with the relation between natural science and worldviews. And um, the usual picture that is drawn is something like this. There is atheism, there is Christian faith, and there's natural science and atheism and natural science, they are friends, they, are, they have a good fit to each other. And on the other side, there is Christian faith and uh, Christian uh, Christianity is somewhat uh, isolated in the modern world and doesn't really fit in. So that's a picture that is uh, often drawn. And um, what we have to look at is what is um, what are worldviews doing? So worldviews are talking about values, goals, and meanings, and things like that. And um, <clears throat> if you look at it, of course, there are many worldviews, and I've only put these two on atheism and Christian faith because that's what we're talking about. And um, I'll just give you a quick overview: of what are worldviews doing? They talk about personal opinions. They talk about uh, views. Um, they talk about uh, explanation of the world, um, the society, uh, the individual. Um, they eventually talk about the meaning of life. Um, so that's, that are the topics that we deal with when we talk about worldviews. Um, now, looking at these two worldviews, we have on one side, atheism, basically saying there is no God. That's the basic statement of, athe of atheism. And it is an ontological atheism. It is a statement of what there is and what exists and what does not exist. So ontology uh, says, um, make statements about things which exist or, not, or do not exist. And that's the basic statement of God of, of uh, atheism that God doesn't exist. Now, um, the, uh, the, philosophically, um, uh, the philosophical picture is of course more, uh, more evolved and there's a great theory around it and that's what we call naturalism. And that basically says that all phenomena in the world can be described by natural science. Um, and that boils down to laws of nature that can de then describe everything that's going on. Now, as Christians, we uh, say God exists. God is a person. God is eternal, all-knowing, all-powerful, completely free and good. And um, of course, these are all properties uh, we can ascribe to God and it would be too long to to define them all, it just gives you sort of an overview. And uh, it's very important to uh, again and again realize that God is a person. God is not a principle, a power, or something like that. God is a person. That's very important. Because, um, and also, God is triune and he wants a personal relationship with every human. And only a person can have a personal relationship. A principle or a power or so cannot have a personal relationship. So these are basic statements that those worldviews make. Now, um, looking at natural science, what is natural science doing? Natural science aims to describe, to predict, and to understand uh, natural phenomena. It's based on observational and empirical evidence. So we go in, into nature, see what's happening, or we do experiments and uh, see how nature reacts. And um, it is also it also requires, if possible, reproducibility. So we want to reproduce reproduce the results we get, um, uh, which means it should not only work once, but it should work all the time. And um, <clears throat> it um, also um, attempts to find general uh, rules, and uh, we say these rules they are basically uh, natural laws, mathematically defined. And um, the results must be independent of the researcher. 
So if you do something in Miller's lab or in Meyer's lab, then the results should be the same. And um, that's sometimes called objectivity. This is a little bit of difficult sort of description, but what we mean is um, the results should be independent of uh, individual researchers or of their opinions or so. So in very broad sense, we talk about mechanisms. And um, so if we, if we look at the picture, we find that we have uh, world views on one level and um, we have um, values, goals, meanings, things like that. And uh, looking at natural science, uh, we have mechanisms. And um, so what we can see is the conflict is not between natural science and uh, Christian faith, or not necessarily. The conflict is between uh, these worldviews, that's quite clear. And um, the other question you could ask is, uh, what is the relation of atheism to natural science, of Christian faith to natural science? Um, and what we can find is that uh, atheism looks at nature or natural science in a naturalistic way. And we as Christians look at, at nature um, as creation. And that makes a difference. So um, natural science describes all reality that exists. That is a statement uh, that an atheist would make. And it's usually a reductionistic view. That means um, everything can be described by uh, natural processes. And uh, that's what we call causal closure. There's nothing that enters into it. It's a system basically as a clockwork, so to say. And um, there is no way um, for other entities to, to enter in there. Now, as Christians, uh, we have a different view. We look at natural science describing mechanisms, uh, but um, we look at nature being part of creation. Um, so it depends on how you put it. It's open for uh, transcendence or it's embedded in transcendence. So uh, natural science is part of the picture, an important part of the picture, but it's not the whole picture. Now, um, if we make a short summary, natural science and worldviews, how do they relate? Natural science deals with natural phenomena. Um, so it has sort of a methodological atheism. It doesn't say anything about the existence of God or could, it, could exist or not, but um, it's not within the mythology. So there is no ontological statement. However, atheism adds a philosophical assumption to science and says um, there is no God. So this is an ontological atheism. And um, obviously, this is not the same. Um, so putting ontological atheism into science is a philosophical assumption that you put into the system, which does not necessarily belong in there. So um, natural science is interested in mechanisms. It's transsubjectively, which means um, it should be independent of the person who does it. Uh, and it should be reproducible as far as you can. Um, so if you can re uh, reproduce experiments, that's fine. If you look at the universe, we cannot reproduce the universe. We just have to live with the one we have um, and we have to make all observations uh, that we can. Now, atheism and Christian faith are interested in value, in meaning, in personal relation. And um, the, there is an alleged, uh, many times uh, um, people say there is a conflict between uh, faith and science, but this is an alleged conflict. It's not a real conflict. And uh, such an alternative as faith and science or belief or knowledge is unsuitable and is misleading. And you shouldn't be trapped into this kind of misleading uh, alternative. So the false alternative boils down to a conflict between worldviews. There is quite another way to look at it, uh, and that's a Christian view on science, and that was very nicely expressed by Kepler. Kepler, the famous astronomer, here's the picture, uh, said the world, or his, his, um, uh, what he wants to say is the world and the laws of nature are an expression of the character of God. And he says uh, in 1619, the chief aim of all investigations of the external world should be to discover the rational order and harmony which has been imposed on it by God and which he revealed to us in the language of mathematics. I know not everybody loves mathematics, but that's just the way he said it. So his idea is Christian faith, 
that could be called a method of logical theism, but this expression is not the usual expression, gives a solid ground for doing science. Why? Because God is an intelligible God who, uh, who creates an ordered universe, and we have, given, have been given an intellect to understand how this universe works. So that fits all together very well and gives you one strain of argument and one line why it makes sense to do science. So um, I, I guess not all of you are scientists and maybe not all of you are physicists. So um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, how, how science or uh, physics works. And there's a very nice picture of the physicist's fishnet. And that goes as follows. It's a tale that has been told by Hans-Peter Dürer and other people before. Um, so there's a marine scientist that does research of life in the sea and he uses a fishnet. Now he has a fishnet and um, he uh, does fishing and he makes two observations. One is all fish are larger than five centimeters and all fish have gills. Now, and that happens again and again, and this can be repeated, and he calls these observations fundamental laws of fishing, uh, as they are confirmed each time. Now, um, then a philosopher comes along. Now, if philosophers come along, sometimes things get complicated, sometimes things get easier. Um, he is asking this guy, uh, well, um, may, may it be that um, the reason why all fish are larger than five centimeters is that um, you are using a net uh, with a certain mesh width. And he said, well, I don't care. I have never uh, uh, um, fished something else, so I don't care about other fish. Um, they're not, I'm not interested in that. And uh, then the philosopher asks, well, uh, it, it may be that uh, one time you catch a fish that has no gills, what do you do then? And he said, well, that has never happened to me. I don't care about that. So um, what does this, uh, this uh, little story tell us? It tells us that natural science does not deal with the world itself, so to say. It deals with, with a filtered projection. It deals with a certain view on nature and makes models out of it and it uses educated observations of reality. Usually we do experiments because we can control all the conditions very nicely in uh, these kind of experiments. And um, the knowledge we gain therefore has its own character. And um, the character of scientific exper experience is qualitatively different compared to reality itself. It's a bit as if you compare a picture with the original, yeah? Um, if you look at a picture, the picture contains many aspects of the original, but it is not the original. Things are missing. It's just giving certain aspects. So um, how do then scientists obtain scientific models? Um, scientific models are gained from experiments, from repeated experiments, from observations, and so on. Um, now there is a problem. Um, these scientific models are principally underdetermined. And that means we, all, we only can make a finite number of observations. We cannot prove a general law. So if you have caught a million fish, the next one might be different. Um, so all models have a principally hypothetical character. So if you say all swans are white, um, then you only have to get one black one. And then, you're, uh, then what you say has been disproved. So um, we have to be careful. Um, there may be something that we have not discovered yet. There may be something that changes our uh, experience and our models. Um, on top of that, research is a creative process. Uh, so what we are doing is we gather um, data, like this physicist here gathers his data, and then he makes a model out of this. And this is a creative process. This is guided by ideas and thoughts of the researcher. Uh, so there always, uh, there's always some sort of subjective element in it. And um, now, of course, there has been a development, a huge development in science. And there's a branch, uh, it's called philosophy of science. And these guys think about the way science is made. And you should maybe um, uh, have heard of Karl Popper. He's a philosopher and he introduced the concept of falsifiability, which means that one counter example is enough to falsify a theory. That's what I said before. If you make a, a, a 
a law saying all swans are white and you only have to get one a black one and then the uh, theory is falsified. Now this is very effective and every uh, scientific statement um, must be falsifiable in principle. But um, if you are too quick with dropping your theory, you will never get somewhere. So what people do is they sort of develop their theories, their ideas, and they do not throw everything away if there is one thing that doesn't really fit. And um, the way how that works was investigated by Thomas Kuhn. Thomas Kuhn is another philosopher and he talked about paradigms. So um, what people do when they develop theories is they develop a guiding idea or they have a guiding idea or concept of the formation of a convincing theory. And the strong part is that you are led by a paradigm which gives you a sort of an orientation where you want to go. Of course, the, the, the drawback is that your paradigm might be too narrow or might be wrong and then you may follow a path for a long time which is not really valid. But the paradigm gives orientation. So if you look at this picture, the father fish says to the son fish, the world, my son, is nothing but a big box full of water. That's not entirely wrong, but of course uh, it's, not, it's not the truth because he's looking at his own environment and in this uh, sense it's true, but it's, it's not the whole picture. And so we have to be careful uh, uh, not to be uh, narrowed in our views by paradigms which uh, capture only part of uh, reality. So then, um, the important question, or one important question is what convinces you? When do you think something is okay or is right? And uh, usually people ask for proofs and they ask, prove me God or prove me whatever. And we will see that that doesn't work. Now, why? What is a proof? A proof is an argument that makes a statement, a claim or so irrevocably true. So if you uh, go into uh, geometry and have the uh, statement of Pythagoras, then you know, if you can go through the, through the proof, then you see, okay, this is correct, and this has always been correct, and this will always be correct. Uh, so that's the charm of mathematics, that you can prove things. And so the good message is there are proofs, the, best me the bad message is this is only true in mathematics or say logic. Um, why is that the case? Because it's a formally well-defined system. Um, that, that leaves no way to, to escape, so to say. So everything is strictly defined and then you can draw conclusions uh, which you can prove. However, this is not applicable to normal life. Say, uh, you want to know, should I marry this person? And you ask, can you prove me that you love me? And uh, say, hmm, well, that's difficult. What you can do is something else. You can look for evidence. You can look for, uh, the, example, is this person truthful? Has he been reliable over the last years? So even if he was always reliable, he would probably also be reliable in the future. So what you do is you gather evidence, which means you gather arguments that make a statement plausible or even extremely plausible. And um, you ask, are there good arguments for or against the thesis? Um, what is the explanatory content of the thesis? So uh, if you find the landlord has been murdered and there are the fingerprints of the gardener on the knife and the gardener would inherit uh, the property of the landlord and uh, the gardener cannot prove where he was at the time of the murder, so then uh, the gardener has a bad time. But that's not a proof. You have to look for further evidence and see, could he be the murderer? Where has he been probably somewhere else or what, uh, whatever you can gather and then after gathering a lot of arguments, you will make a decision, you will have to make a decision. Now, um, the uh, basic, that's the basic element of natural science and daily life, to gather evidence and to follow the best evidence. Um, if you want to look at that a little bit closer, I recommend you the book of Richard Swinburne, Is There a God? He describes this very carefully. Now, um, there are certain questions which atheism and Christianity should answer. Um, atheism cannot explain why anything exists at all. This might be um, surprising because normally one doesn't think about it because there is something. So um, yeah, things are just there, but this is a question, uh, a worldview should answer. 
um, we uh, think about God as the first cause of the existence of the universe. So we have to compare these two kind of explanations or non-explanations. Um, atheism also cannot explain why the universe allows for life. And I don't mean evolution. I mean the foundations of evolution. I mean, why are the natural laws made in the way or why are, why are they in the way they are? Why are the natural constants in the way they are? Um, and I think um, atheism has no answer. And these two questions, I think, are not questions of the gap, uh, God for, for the God of the gaps or so. Um, there are some, there are really fundamental questions. Um, uh, and, and it's not to be expected that they sort of close, but uh, some questions are more and more widening and opening. Um, so as Christians, we believe the universe has the purpose to allow for life. So God has created the universe in a way um, or has established or set up the universe in a way that um, it allows for the development of life. So atheism says humans are only, and the emphasis on only, only complex machines and only a product of chance. We believe that humans are made in the image of God, including consciousness and minds. And atheists have to justify why there is something like consciousness and mind, and that's difficult in the context of evolution. And atheism says there are only natural processes as an explanation for any event. And we say, okay, God acts in the world. There are many other points, of course, um, and I don't have the time to go through all of them. I will concentrate on the question here, explanatory, uh, cannot, uh, the atheism cannot explain why anything exists at all. You can look at these um, arguments uh, in, a, in a book that I will quote later, that I've recently published, also from Alvin Plantinger and Richard Swinburne. They have beautifully written on that. I will show you some references later, so don't worry about that. Um, why can the atheist not explain why anything exists at all? So we look at the case study, a universe from nothing. And um, about now 10 years ago, um, Hawking and Rodinov um, published a book called The Grand Design. Um, Hawking is well known because he is a famous physicist and he has uh, done interesting work on black holes and so on. And he died uh, in 2018 and he was uh, in, a, in a wheelchair and had a very bad disease. And, and in spite of that, uh, um, contributed uh, very uh, interesting things to physics. And uh, to, the, to the end of his life, he got more and more philosophic. And um, in, in this book, The Grand Design, which is the grand design of the universe, what it means, he says, uh, or he asks, why is there something and not nothing? Why do we exist? That's a question one should ask. And he said, uh, some would argue that the answer to this question is that there is a God who created the universe. And he comes to another conclusion. He says, we, however, claim that it is possible to answer this question only within the realm of science. And then he continues, the development of a great multitude of universes does not require the intervention of a, of a supernatural being of, or of a God. These universes are formed naturally due to physical laws. And many people have taken that up and they say, okay, the question is answered. We don't need God anymore, even not in the beginning. So uh, why do we care? But if you look at it, um, the universe forms due to physical laws and from nothing, that is strange. So is the universe formed due to physical laws or from nothing? So if it, for, if it forms from nothing, then there are no laws which are required due to Hawking. And, um, if it forms from physical laws, then where do the physical laws come? Ah, so that's not very satisfying. So what they did actually was um, Hawking and others, they postulated, there are also other books which go in the same direction. Um, they postulate a quantum vacuum in the beginning and they say, this is nothing. So everything started from, from a quantum vacuum. Um, but that doesn't solve the problem. So if there was a quantum, quantum vacuum, which may be, um, that's, that's not nothing. So we are still left with the question is, is there a cause without effect? Is there something that comes from nothing? So physics always has to deal with the starting point and then continues on, but physics cannot start from nothing. So imagine this is nothing. 
And here we have no energy, we have no matter, we have no space, we have no time, we have no laws. We also have no structures, we have no quantum vacuum, no other structures, however you would call them. And now let's make a universe out of it. So if you can do it, let me know, I'd be interested, but I think it won't work. So, um, some people thought, well, B, there must be some ways out. And so many people think, ah, there's a multiverse theory, so the problem is solved. So the idea is there are heaps and heaps of universes, and most of them are just dead because the laws are different and somehow life didn't work out. Um, and there are very few, maybe only one universe, the blue one here, um, where life could develop. But this only shifts the problem because then it's also the question of where is the, where's the beginning coming from? What is the reason? What is the origin of this multiverse? So you shift the problem to a more complicated stage. Um, there's a huge discussion to it and there are many types of, of uh, multiverses which I cannot cover. You can find that in my book. But in the end, you always result in a problem. So I think there is no solution to this question. Now another sort of solution is people say, oh, that was just by chance. There was just, um, it just happened by chance that the, the universe started. But that's a fundamental error. Ex uh, uh, look at this uh, dice here. So if you have a dice, you can uh, throw it and you get a one, a three or six or whatever by chance. But the dice itself does not come into existence by chance. We have to have something to let chance operate but the chance doesn't create anything. And so this is fundamental error to say, oh, it just happened sort of by chance. So um, we can go through these questions. And I think with each of these questions, atheism has a hard time and we have a good standing and good explanations and a good view um, from Christianity. Christianity is very reasonable and gives you in many cases much better answers than atheism can do. However, there is, of course, another bunch of questions which are more existential. And that is, uh, atheists have no hope beyond death. We have a justified hope for eternal life. Atheism has no answer to individual guilt. So whether it's Mother Teresa or whether it's Adolf Hitler, they all um, will just go will, will just um, uh, vanish uh, to dust and that's it and no matter what they have done in their life we know and accept forgiveness this is a different perspective atheism has no basis for objective morality that does not mean that atheists cannot be moral they can lead very good lives they can be very enthusiastic about um, about morality but there's no basis for that so if you say this is objectively right, there is no basis to saying things like that. And also God's character is an absolute reference point for objective mor morality. And this objective reference point is missing in atheism. Also atheism has no answer to suffering. Suffering just sort of happens because things happen by chance. Um, so there is no, no way and no explanation. We have uh, an answer to suffering. It, it's limited. We cannot explain every detail, but we can explain why suffering happens. We are living in a fallen world. We have free will. So we can give an explanation. I think we should be able to give an explanation as far as possible. Also, atheism is, or atheists are nevertheless seeking for meaning and for relevance. Um, what's the question, what is my life for? What, what should I obtain? What, should I, what goals should I pursue? And we as Christians, we know meaning and relevance as God's creature. So it's a totally different perspective we have. And of course, we have many other points. So um, looking at it at daylight, um, there is a conclusion which was put together by Holm Tetens in his nice book, uh, Thinking God, God Denken. Um, a very nice small little booklet. And he said, um, humans are as individuals as well as humankind, a arbitrary, peripheral and temporary episode in a meaningless, immeasurable, extensive 
universe that is nearly everywhere extremely hostile towards life and the fortune and morality of mankind is totally irrelevant to this universe. Steven Weinberg, a physicist, Nobel Prize winner and atheist said the effect, the effort to understand the universe is one of the very few things that lifts human life a little bit above the level of farce and gives it some of the grace of tragedy. That's not very much, and it's only for me, it's only for scientists, it's only for physicists. So if, you're, if you are not a physicist, then you cannot relate to that. So that's a real tragedy. And there's not much left if you think of it. And so um, the rejection of God results in a corruption of thought and heart. Compare the statements of Paul in Romans 1, 18 to 23. I refer that to you and also I've given a talk on that in the last European Leadership Forum 2019, Obstacles and Opportunities for Christian Faith in a Post-Christian Europe. So there's not much left if you think of it. And um, so what is the conclusion we can draw from all of this? So the proposed contradiction between science and faith is unjustified and is misleading. The assessment of worldviews asks for most um, ask for most convincing explanation. No proof is applicable. Atheism cannot answer fundamental questions concerning the existence and properties of the world, the existence and properties of humans, and Christian faith offers reasonable answers concerning the questions of origin, meaning, morality, and the goal of human existence. So to the end, um, there is some literature in my book, which is written in German. You can find uh, lots of these ideas, uh, also in the outline provided. And on the homepage uh, I have here, you can find further literature and video in English and German for your information. And with that, thank you very much for your attention.